science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. So put on your safety glasses, do up your lab coat, hold on to your tail. <laughs> It's time for the Science Podcast. Hello, science enthusiasts. Welcome back to another Science Podcast episode. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. I just got back from Beaker's Last Agility trial slash training day, and she did so good. She's come a long ways. She still can be distracted by other dogs. She sometimes wants to go over, say hi to them or bark at them, but she's come so far and she, she by far was the fastest dog of the crew. And, and you know what? That's just saying that she was the fastest. The other dogs did great too. There was three other dogs that came just as far as Beaker did in such a short amount of time. I'm finding I really like agility training with Beaker. It's so much fun. We might talk about it in the, the family section at the end of the podcast. All right, what's on the podcast this week in science news? We're going to look at a new study that had some interesting ideas about cleaning off solar panels. In pet science, we're going to look at new results that tried to slim down some dogs. <laughs> And our uh, our expert guest is Devin, the chemist. That's right. I get to talk chemistry with our expert guest this week. Hey, dogs, what did one molecule say to the other molecule early in the morning? Up and at him. <laughs> okay. There's so many good chemistry jokes, and I make them periodically. <laughs> okay, on with the show. I don't want to lose any more listeners. Uh, there's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's talk solar panels and alternative energy. I am from Alberta, Canada. Alberta is the oil and gas producing province of Canada. So our governments have been very pro oil and gas for as long as I can remember. There is a push globally to switch to alternative forms of energy because of course, you know, the CO2 thing is not great, as is climate change slash global warming. One great thing about solar panels is once you've built them, they're, they don't make a lot of CO2 pollution. They just use the sun. There are some drawbacks. One is the ability to store that energy and have it on demand on cloudy days or during the night. So to be fair, that is a big issue. Uh, you can just have a power plant run whenever you want and get energy from coal or gas. Of course, it does produce things that aren't great for the environment nor for human health. So the other knock against solar panels that I've seen, and, and it's a tough one to really wrap your head around, is cleaning them. There's estimates all over the place about how much solar will grow in the next decade or so. Right By 2030, there's estimate, estimates that it'll be about 10% of global power supply. And that's enormous considering where it was like 10 or 20 years ago. Most of that will be located in areas with lots of sunlight. Again, most people don't know this, but where we live in Canada, Alberta, the central Alberta, and really just south of us in Calgary, it's one of the sunniest places in all of North America. Yes, it gets cold. But it's also really, really sunny, like bright all the time. I guess not every place is like that. So where do you put solar panels that it's really bright and sunny? Probably the desert. But what's in the desert? Dust. Dust covers up the solar panels. And folks who don't necessarily like solar panels or have an axe to grind with them quite rightly bring up that when solar panels get covered by dust or snow, they kind of stop working. So what is used currently? Well, in Canada, solar panels that get covered with snow, you can just go brush the snow off. Um, you can have some residual heat melt the snow or the ice. Tough to do in the desert when it's dust, um, especially if you're leaving them out there unsupervised, kind of like kind of like uh, kids in a playground. You just don't know what's going to happen and you need to have that just work perfectly and nobody breaks their arm. So again, other estimates from the study is that about 10 billion gallons of water is used per year to clean off solar panels. And that's a lot of water that could go to thirsty folks. Here comes the study. Researchers at MIT have devised a way to clean the solar panels or mirrors of solar panels. And it uses no water. It uses no contact. 
and probably would solve most of the dust issue. Okay, now I was super curious about this when I saw that. I was like, how do you clean something without touching it? And how do you clean dust off of it without water? Well, if we know anything about dust, tiny dust particles, is they're affected by static electricity. Brilliant. So to make it touchless and to make it not use water, they use the power of static electricity. You know, static electricity makes small things cling to, the, to, cling to yourself. Or, I mean, you can, you can also repel certain objects with static electricity if they have the same charge. Okay, so to achieve this, an electrode passes just above the surface panel surface, and that gives one charge to all of the dust particles. They're then repelled by a charge applied to the panel itself. There's a little roller um, that is like there's an electric motor that moves this roller up and down the rails of the panel that imparts the charge to the dust. And the panel itself has a charge imparted to itself. One thing the study's quick to point out is this may seem silly and it might cost some money, but if you just leave solar panels to their own devices um, and let the dust settle on the solar panels, you lose 30% power in about a month if you don't clean it. And then cleaning it with water costs money, especially if it's in the desert. How do you get the water there? Who do you pay? Um, the the annual, annual loss of dust alone is staggering. And it will only increase as we use more and more solar power. An example they used is, uh, for example, like the Chinese uh, and our, the Indians the, and the Americans are using lots of solar panels in the desert. And they use pressure uh, pressure tanks on trucks to blast the, these come in and you might've seen videos of people using pressure hoses to clean off the sidewalk. And that's literally what is used on solar panels. But that water has to be trucked in probably on a car truck currently that uses diesel. <laughs> uh, so again, it's not super green to clean off these solar panels. You're using water that people could drink and you're trucking it in most likely on diesel trucks. So is this ready to roll out? Well, okay. As this is a study, all of this was done in the lab and experiments in the lab showed that the process worked really effectively on those scale installations in the lab. So they weren't full scale, full scale solar panels. They were scaled down so they could do it in the lab with the electrode. It seemed to work really, really good. An interesting point in the study is that you do need a little bit of humidity in the air different humidities impart a tiny bit of water to the dust. And that's what the charge is being given to is the water around the dust. And as long as the humidity of the desert is greater than 30%, you can remove like 99.9% .9 of the particles on the surface. But as the humidity goes down, which means there's less water, I guess, in the air at that temperature, it becomes harder. Now you might think, oh, well, deserts don't have that much humidity. You're right. But um, most of the deserts fall into the 30% humidity range. So that's great. This procedure was outlined in Science Advances. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, it's all about <laughs> a study that tried to make our pets less pudgy. <laughs> uh, lucky for us, especially with Bunsen and Beaker, we've learned our lessons from the golden we've had before. Callan, our beloved dog before Bunsen, was hungry all the time. And as new dog owners, we did not understand the importance of nutrition sometimes. And she packed on the pounds occasionally when we weren't watching it. And she got really pudgy. <laughs> uh, and then we would, oh no, you know, we've made her overweight. So we'd have to put her on a diet. With Bunsen and Beaker, we're definitely we've learned our lesson. Um, we keep Bunsen at a very, very uh, athletic build. He looks super chunky, uh, but that's all of his fuzz, his fluff. He is not. He is built very, very slim. Um, we use the rib test and the whole idea, especially with big dogs, to keep them at a very slim weight is it's way better on their joints in the long run. And sadly, that's why some big dogs, like their owners have to make that really painful de decision that their quality of life has gone down because they can't walk anymore, um, that it's time to, you know, euthanize them. And uh, with Beaker, we've kept her super slim. 
So if you look, take a look at Beaker, she's built like an arrow, and that is by our design, and that is by talking to our vet about giving the dogs appropriate food, and we really stick to that. They get treats when they're training, um, but aside from that, not. Maybe that's why Beaker's always hunting for things in the grass. <laughs> So this study took a look at a bunch of overweight dogs and they fed them a specific diet to see how that diet impacted their weight loss. The diet given to these dogs for 24 weeks was a reduced calorie, high protein, high fiber diet. And the long and short of it is the dogs all achieved a healthier weight without losing a lot of muscle mass. And they had, uh, they checked their blood for triglycerides, insulin, and inflammatory markers, and they all decreased with their weight loss. So just like people, that's one of the things, I guess, I never really thought of with Kellen. And it's not that we were being malicious, but if you have a slightly overweight dog, and Kellen definitely was at different parts, points of her life, they have the same issues that humans have when they're overweight. Insulin issues, potentially, um, the wrong fats in their blood even like inflammation parts of their body. So all of that is tied to weight. The findings were reported in the Journal of Animal Science. One of the reasons that set this study apart is they also looked at the, the microbiota of the, the dogs that lost weight. You might remember one of the last science studies I talked about was taking fecal bacteria from one person without peanut allergies and putting it in somebody with peanut allergies, and it helped them with their allergies. Uh, and the same is true with dogs, that if it's so important for humans to have this pr- proper microbiota, that's probably the same for dogs. And humans and dogs don't have the same bacteria in our gut. So, of course, you're not going to compare our gut to their gut. But the study took a look at the gut's bacteria before in the microbiota and after. Just like us, these small organisms help metabolize proteins, molecules that are derived from food but escape digestion, so like fibers. Um, And that's why this, this diet had high fiber in it. The fiber in dogs can be broken down into fatty acids that are super important in keeping their appetite in check, also reducing inflammation. Now, I guess one of the things I should point out and one of the conclusions of the study is that it was inconclusive about the microbiota before and after. They did mention that the uh, ammonia in the dog's feces was down after the study. And uh, the reason why is that they feel it's probably from the reduced calories and the protein. Uh, they're in a high calorie diet, you're going to have more proteins and ammonia is not great high concentrations of it can be toxic. There were some increases in bacteria that help break down fiber into those short chain fatty acids. It was promising to see that the gut bacteria increased, but what was disappointing and why it was inconclusive is that those fatty acids that these bacteria would produce were the same pre and post in the dogs. The fatty acids that the this specific bacteria produces called fecal butyrate. It's something from the fermentation of fiber that has anti-inflammatory, anti-carcinogenic effects in the gut. That was remained unchanged before and after. So one thing to think about, uh, I guess if your dog's gotten a little pudgy, I stop the, stop the snacks, <laughs> just like us humans. I'm so bad with snacks at night. Stop the snacks and maybe think about talking to your vet about the study. It's a high-protein, high-fiber, calorie-reduced diet for dogs. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey, everybody. Before we get to the interview section, I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. Now back to the interviews. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I am super delighted to have Dr. Devin Swiner, who's a senior scientist at Merck. How are you doing today, Devin? I'm really good. How are you? 
I'm good. And thank you so much for putting up with the technical difficulties and hungry dogs and dogs barking. This has not been my finest moment as a podcast host. No, totally fine. My puppy got a hold of a squeaky toy, so it's totally understandable. Where are you calling into the podcast from? Where are you in the world, Devin? I'm in New Jersey, so I live in like the Woodbridge area, which I think is technically central Jersey, but don't quote me on that. Right. And New Jersey is a, a state or is it a city? Yes. I forget. Yeah. It's a state. Yeah. yeah. It's I'm kind of the northeast okay. of the U.S. Can't get All right. Well, let's let's talk about you and your education and what you do, because I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, your your knowledge, because it's in my wheelhouse. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> what... <laughs> What what's your education is in? What do you have a PhD in? Yeah, so I just graduated from Ohio State University. That's in Ohio, here in the U.S. Yeah, um, and I got my PhD in analytical chemistry. So I'm a chemist that analyzes all of the things. <laughs> you you analyze right. all the things. All of the things, yeah. So my background in grad school is specifically in small molecule analysis. So all of the things that I did was develop new ways to look at really small compounds that had some sort of clinical relevance, whether it was drug screening um, for pharmaceutical drugs or illicit drugs, all the way to trying to find new biomarkers for obesity, which has implications in cancers and heart diseases. Um, so yeah, so that's what I have my PhD in. You're technically, potentially, one of the people on the CSI shows. They're like, send this in for analyzation. <laughs> But of yeah, course, it's all magic, I right? Any, right. It's definitely magic. And everything that they show you on those shows that they think is one person is actually multiple teams of people, <laughs> <laughs> which is very eye-opening for me. So I originally wanted to do forensics. That was like my thing. And then as soon as I got to grad school, that drastically changed. And now I work for a pharmaceutical company. Okay. So. Okay. So one of the things I'm, I, I'm always so curious about is what got them so interested in science? Uh, like it, what you see, you mentioned you, you're interested in forensic science, but is that where, you know, what drove you through, I guess, going to university to pursue a science, uh, background? Yeah. Great question. I've always been that, well, why child? <laughs> <laughs> I was always trying to figure out why things were the way that they were. And my parents noticed when I was little that I had a knack for science. So I wanted to be everything from an astronomer. So I used to want to work for NASA and go to space. Then I wanted to be a doctor for a little bit. And I was like, oh, surgery sounds cool. And then I saw how long and how expensive med school was. <laughs> then I was like, maybe not. Um, but my granddad, actually, when he was alive, he was a detective. Um, so that's kind of where the forensic side came from was, you know, knowing he was a detective in District of Columbia out in D.C., um, was just really interesting. And then naturally, all of the influx of forensic shows, CSI, NCIS, piqued my interest. Um, so that's really what it was. In high school, chemistry was the thing, my favorite science. It was that thing that just made sense. And I love that chemistry builds on top of each other. Um, so by the time I was in, I guess, 11th grade, as a junior in high school, everybody knew, oh, Devin's going to go to college. She's going to be a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is history, I suppose. Oh, uh, that's cool. I have I have an undergrad in chemistry. Um, oh, and then cool. I have an after degree in education. So I'm a chemistry. High, I teach high school chemistry. So I didn't get past that undergrad because um, it was choice of master's or under, you know, uh, do something else with it. And I was the type of person in university and high school where my team was like, get him to talk. He's the talky guy. Yeah. So that's probably why I'm a teacher instead of a researcher or, you know, also, also, I just have so much respect for people that get to do what you do. That's amazing. Um, you mentioned you work with, you were specialized in small molecules and, and like studying them for illicit drug screening. You did that in your your university training to, to towards your PhD. Yes, that's what I did for my PhD. Um, so I used an instrument called a mass spectrometer. Yeah, um, and I love I love mass spec. <laughs> Let's break it down for people who have no idea <laughs> what a mass spectrometer <laughs> is. Can would you be able to do that for us? Ah, oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yay. Okay. So essentially, what mass spectrometers do are they help you identify or quantify compounds. And they do that by looking at essentially how much they weigh. So we know that certain things have particular molecular weights or masses, and the instrument looks at them in the gas phase. 
So whether or not they pick up a charge, so they're positively charged, or they get rid of a charge and they're negatively charged, that's what the mass spec looks at. They look at the mass to charge ratio of compounds, which is pretty cool. And there's so many different types of mass specs that can look at smaller compounds like I did, um, or look at really large proteins, or they look, help to develop the vaccines, like, we've, like we're watching in real time with the COVID vaccine. Nine times out of 10, they're probably using a mass spectrometer to help them identify what's going on. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So all of the samples have to be a gas? Like, how do you do that if something is a solid to begin with? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so my PhD work looked at biological fluid samples. So I looked at liquids. I looked at blood. I looked at serum, all types of liquids. And what happens is mass spec happens in three stages. So the first stage is getting them to the gas phase. And you can do that in so many different ways. You can put them, you can charge them with some form of electricity. And um, that's what my lab did. We hooked it up to the instrument and shocked it, essentially. And that heats them up. (laughs) You just, you shocked it until it was a, it was a gas. What? Until it was a gas. Yeah. So we use really high voltages that you should not use at home, (laughs) but we use thousands of volts to get these compounds or these liquids to evaporate into the gas phase. And then those get transferred into the mass spectrometer. And that's the ionization part. So my job was to figure out ways, innovative ways to create ions. So put things from solid liquid phase into the gas phase to then get separated in the instrument and detected by the computer. So you have to have them have some kind of charge or do they pick up a charge through this experiment? Because that's how the machine, um, if I'm remembering it right, the machine needs that to read what's going through it. Yes. So during the ionization process, so that first step where we're taking any kind of compound or any kind, any kind of sample type and putting it, converting it to the gas phase, it picks up a charge along the way. So if you give something, if you shoot it something with a high voltage like we did, it typically, for the sample that we were using, picked up a positive charge. So it grabbed an ion, grabbed a hydrogen, essentially, in the air and hit the instrument. Hmm. What does a mass spectrometer look like? There's so many different types of mass spectrometers. Okay, all right. That's a tough question. I'm sorry. I'm just... I, I'm, no, no. It's, a, totally it's tough because it's an audio program, right? So. Oh, yeah. So some of them look like really big boxes that sit on top of tables. Others of them can fill a room. So they're six feet long Whoa. or six feet tall. Yeah. So those instruments that are bigger like that look at larger compounds because oh. they need more time to get through the instrument and to separate out. So yeah. So that's like smallest instrument and the biggest instrument. Now this might be this might be a really tough question. Um I'm I'm curious and I'm sure our listeners are curious. When you say the machine detects it, what mm-hmm. how how does it detect it? Like how Yeah. If it's a gas mm-hmm. and you've like zapify, it's like it's a liquid and you zapified it and now it's getting all jiggy with like charges. How does the machine, how does the machine detect that sucker? Yeah. So there are different kind of detectors for mass spec, but the most common um, are, are detectors that essentially take the ion. So that's what is when a compound is charged, it's an ion. So the ion will hit a surface inside of the instrument. So it'll hit a metal. And that ejects an electron. An electron is a really small negatively charged particle that exists. Um, And then that electron hits another piece of metal and that amplifies it. It creates more electrons and it cascades. So it really looks like um, like a cornucopia, like one of those horns for Thanksgiving. Mm. That's essentially what it's in a mass spectrometer. Um, And the electrons are what actually gets detected by the computer. Oh, cool. So these things, these ions, do you have to... Are they ex- are they accelerated towards this detector? Like are they gravity fed? Do you chuck them? Yeah. Like what? They have you. They have no, to hit the thing, right? I'm just curious, like how they, they hit, the hit the thing. Yeah. So yeah, things with charge move, and how fast or how slow they move is based on how much they weigh. So big things move really slow. Um, fast, small things move really fast. And what happens in the mass spectrometer are there are a lot of pumps and a lot of electrodes. So things that have some form of electricity that guide the ions along the way. Mm. There are lots of mechanisms and optics, essentially, in an instrument that get them from the ionization step all the way to the detector. Oh, cool. This is amazing. Thank you for explaining that. No, you're 
your phone call. I love <laughs> talking about Mass Effect. So. <laughs> well, you're the first perfect person. Um, um, I, can I ask one more question about that before we move on? Yeah. Are they expensive? Like, can the average person have one in their house? No, they cannot have one in their house because <laughs> it costs a lot of money. Oh. They're hundreds of thousands of dollars to some of the really big instruments that have really good resolution um, are millions of dollars. Oh, my <laughs> so goodness. The average person would probably not have a mass spectrometer in the house. So we need some richy rich money is what you're saying. Like instead of basically. Yeah. Like if you got like if you got some like Will Smith money instead of buying uh, I watched the video he wanted to buy a swamp. Maybe you could buy yourself a mass spectrometer. Yeah, pretty much. They're really useful. You can pretty much look at just about anything with a mass spec. (laughs) I love it. That's great. And just to recap before we move on, these machines are the thing that lets you know what's in just about anything like the sky's the limit it's like a it's like a giant detective machine essentially yes that's a perfect way to put it Hmm. i love it all right so mass spectrometer that's great uh next question can you talk to us about what you're working on right now or is it hush hush secrety secrety because you mentioned you're working with a a pharmaceutical company (laughs) Yes. I don't so want I don't want Pfizer, Pfizer to come after me. Like I don't want to open my door and get roundhouse kicked by some Pfizer person. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. I can okay. tell you some stuff that I do. <laughs> okay. Some of the semantics, not really, but I work for uh, Merck, and that's a large pharmaceutical company. You might people might recognize Merck from like Keytruda, so the cancer drug. That's a Merck product. Um, among other things that mm-hmm. Merck makes. But what I work on specifically, I still do analytical chemistry, and I'm still characterizing compounds. They're just now drugs. Hmm. And I work on drug products. So when you think about when you take medicines, so if you take like Tylenol um, or Advil, they're in tablets. I work on oral formulations, so tablets, capsules, things like that. Um, people in my department also work on implants, work on injectable medicines, so things that go in IVs. Or even work on um, respiratory, like inhalers. Hmm. So it's pretty cool. It's really diverse um, in the drug product side of the company. Um, and yeah, so I'm working on characterizing these drug products all the way from the preclinical stages. So before we even put them on clinical trials, all the way through market phase. So it's really interesting <laughs> getting to like watch a drug go from just an idea, like, oh, hey, we can tackle this disease or we can tackle, you know, this and seeing how everybody works together to get it through clinical trials so we can help make patients' lives simpler. Oh, that's that's profound. I'm just trying to I'm just <laughs> I'm just a little stunned right now trying to think of a a follow-up question. So, um hopefully this isn't too broad of a question, but I think for our audience it would really help. When you said you do analytical chemistry with um, the development of these drugs. Could mm-hmm. you, t- could you give us a couple examples of what that would look like? What are some things you, you would do like, um, yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a fair question. Yeah. So when you have, when you're trying to develop a drug, right. We're right now we're trying to figure out, okay, well, what's the best dose, right? Mm. So like, you know, when you take Tylenol or Advil, there's a dosage, take two pills every six to eight hours. Don't exceed, you know, six pills in a day. Right. So it's my job to actually make sure that's the case. So when we make these tablets or make these oral formulations, do do we get the dosage right? Like if we say it's going to be a hundred milligram pill, is there a hundred milligrams? Does it go through the body like it's supposed to? That's Hmm. part of our job too. Like we mimic body conditions in the lab just to make sure that the drug is releasing when we want it to release. Um, We also look at, is it even the right formulation? Right. Like, do we want like a regular tablet? Or you know how some tablets have that like sweet coating on them? Do we want a tablet with a coating? Do we even want a capsule? So it's our job to really fully characterize these drugs to make sure they're not only safe, so they don't degrade into anything toxic for people, um, but also to make sure that they work like we want them to work. Okay, that is amazing. I totally get it now. Um, um, is that what makes you excited about your your job, which like what you're working on right now? Is it some... Um... It's like you're taking something that is like on the drawing board and then you can hold it in your hand eventually. 
Yeah, that's what really drew me to the pharmaceutical industry. Like I knew because I wanted to do forensics. I knew I wanted my science to help people. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, hmm, maybe I don't want a crime to have to happen first for my work to actually matter. Um, And what I realized when I was in grad school was that I like the health side. Like, how do I help people feel better? Um, And how can I use science to drive just that? I mean, so far, I've only been there three months, (laughs) but so far, what's been really interesting is how much I've learned along the way from different parts of the company and also realizing that it's never a dull moment and that you can constantly learn because no, you know, two drugs are alike. So getting to increase my um, knowledge and also add some more analytical tools to my toolbox um, has been really great. So that's really what's been helpful knowing that the work that I'm doing actually is helping drive medicine uh, for people to take. Hmm. Ella, like Batman, you're just getting extra, <laughs> extra gear on your belt, right? Yep. Yep. Pretty much. Hmm. Cool. So let's, let's move on uh, to the pet story. It's a really popular question on the podcast where we, and when you mentioned you got a little puppy, um, <laughs> We ask our guests to share a pet story from their life. Uh, could you could you share a pet story from your life with us? Yeah, sure. So this was recent. I was really trying. So Baxter's a four month old golden doodle. He's gonna be medium, but he's pretty big. Um, so we've been like working on training a puppy like you're supposed to, trying to be a good dog parent, <laughs> raise a good cane citizen. So I was trying to keep him off my bed <laughs> oh. for the longest time. Like he already was on the couch and I was like, okay, you can stay on the couch because you're not doing anything crazy on the couch. But my <laughs> bed was like, no bags, we can't get on there. So I was getting ready for work one day. Uh, uh, Baxter was just eyeballing my bed and I was like, oh no, it's going to happen. But instead of climbing or jumping on the short end of the bed, he went on the long side like the side of my bed which was weird and he jumped up and just looked at me and I was like seriously are we are you are you not gonna move and he didn't move so in protest he laid down (laughs) he laid down on top of my pillows because he smelled me (laughs) and I took a picture of it before I got him off the bed um but now every time I'm in my room and if I'm taking too long getting ready he makes himself comfortable uh in the midst of all of my pillows I, I think I hear Baxter right now. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, Mom, what are we doing? <laughs> Where'd the name Baxter come from? I like naming. And I, oh, Bax. <laughs> it's all good. It makes it really good for the podcast. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Uh, so I like naming things and I like things to coordinate. So my car's name is Bella. Um, so when I was getting a dog, I knew that I wanted to coordinate their names. So I needed a male name that started with B that was two syllables. Um, and my dad also really likes naming things. So I called him and I was like, all right, dad, here's the criteria for the dog's <laughs> name. Like I need a B name, but it needs to be two syllables because I like shortening it. So I can call him Bex. And like, he's starting to answer that answer to that too, which is funny. Um, and we had a short list of names, but Baxter was the name that I was like, oh, this is a really cute dog name. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not too human where people would be like, really, you named your dog Bob? I'm like, leave my dog alone. But it's, it, was, it was perfect. And he picked up on his name really quickly. So I'm going to assume he likes it. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, you got to be careful sometimes, especially if you name your dog a, a really human name. You may meet a human in your life. I've heard that before yeah. on the podcast <laughs> where where the dog's name is like Charlie or something like that. And then the, oh. the, 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 the scientist meets a Charlie and they start dating and now there's two Charlies and, two Charlies, yeah. you know, you gotta watch out for that. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to be thoughtful about it. Like, what are the odds I'm going to get another Bax? <laughs> mm, probably yeah. low. <laughs> so, so yeah. far so good. I haven't met another one. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. Um, if you have a second, we'd love a picture of Baxter or we'll, with permission, can we use one from your social media? Yeah, totally fine. All I'm right. pretty sure I have a bunch of pictures on there of him. Okay, <laughs> awesome. I can also send you one. Perfect, perfect. We'll look, I'll look first, yeah. Okay. All right, so Baxter the Golden Doodle. Is it a 50-50 <laughs> split or do you think it's like more to the doodle or more Ooh. more to the golden? That's a good question. So I know both of his parents were golden doodles. Mm. So he's multi-gen for sure. Yeah. Um, But he doesn't shed much of any. 
but he is golden like a retriever is. So he might be relatively evenly split. Hmm. Um, Personality wise, he's a balanced puppy. (laughs) He's very friendly and super loyal like Goldens are, but also really smart like a poodle. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I think he's pretty evenly split, I think. Yeah, golden retrievers are goofy smart. Like they are, they're highly intelligent, but they're just like, what are you doing? Yeah, sometimes he's definitely like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wish, uh, like, we love we love Bunsen and Beaker, and people always are worried about how much hair Bunsen makes because he's the Bernice Mountain Dog, uh, yeah. and we're like nothing in comparison <laughs> to how much Beaker sheds because Beaker sheds all the time, right? Whereas yeah. Bunsen sheds it's shed Mageddon a couple times a year. Um, but yeah, so that, you know, the, that's the good thing about the, the, the split breed is you get a little mm-hmm. less hair. Yeah. You get a little bit of both. That's the both world. Yeah. Ideally. Well, thanks for sharing about Baxter. That's super cute. Yeah. No problem. The other, uh, question, standard question we ask our guests is for the super fact. And the super fact is something that you know that you tell people sometimes, or you just keep it in your brain and when you are going to share it, it kind of might blow people away a bit. Do you have a super fact you could share with us? I can give you a super fact. So something that I think is really interesting for my friends that like aren't chemists is when I tell them that graphite, so the thing that's in pencils and diamonds are made of the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) They're always like, really? I'm like, yep, they're both just carbon. It's just the carbon is stacked in different ways. One way you get a pencil, another way you get a nice diamond. So that is my super fact. I love that. But you can't write with a diamond, can you? No, I don't. I think that'd be really hard to do. (laughs) I also don't think that if you gave, you know, your spouse to be a pencil instead of a ring, I don't know how that would work either. So I don't think they're interchangeable. Yeah. It would be convenient, though, if you were without a pencil, you could just take off your ring and use it. Yeah, that would be really convenient. <laughs> but is it true? I think I remember reading this. I'm sure I've taught this to kids. So hopefully I was wrong, wasn't wrong. Like when you go, when you leave a streak of graphite on a paper, you're, you're just leaving graphite behind in like a little sheet, right? Like a blanket of it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, graphite exists in a sheet naturally. So like that's just the, I guess the coordination or in space, what it looks like. So yeah, it is just a sheet. Oh, I got a I got a question about that that maybe ties back to mass spec. Um, graphite and diamond, if you were to run them through a mass spectrometer, would they have a different profile, be, or would they have the same profile because they're the same? They're made of the same stuff. They would have the same profile, um, but you could use a different analytical technique to tell which one is which. Um, and I feel like confirmationally you will want to use something like spectroscopic um so that actually shows you pictures of something or mm. with some with a um, an instrument that can shine light on things um or even like a physical characterization technique so something that'll take pictures of what you're doing and you can see i guess where all of the carbons and things are oh so you, but in mass spec you they would be the same thing oh that's cool it wouldn't be anything I guess that's a dumb question because you could literally just look at it and say, oh, well, that's a diamond. But I guess if it's really, <laughs> if it's yeah, really, really it small. Like, yeah. Yeah. If it was powdered and yeah. you didn't know which powder was which, you could probably do like x-ray diffraction on mm. it because that uses powder samples. But I don't do x-ray diffraction. No, that's all. I was just, I was just curious. <laughs> that is a super fact. Um, I love that. that. And it had a super kind of ending to it. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> um, the last section of the last section of the podcast is a fun, you know, area because we get to know a little bit more about our guest. Um, it's the important to you section. Some guests have talked about hobbies, uh, things that they care about causes. Um, and, uh, you wanted to talk about black and chem. Uh, could you, yeah. could you speak to that please? Yeah. So black and chem is a social media movement, I suppose is the best word for it. That really centers black chemists. So typically, you know, when you go and talk to people and you're like, well, what does a chemist look like? They don't know. Or can you name a chemist? They either don't know any chemist or if they do, they're not black people. Um, So what was really important to myself and the other co-founders last summer um, was to really highlight what black chemists are doing. Um, So last August was the first or our inaugural black chemist week. Um, And we did a lot of science communication. We talked about the common five divisions of chemistry. 
Um, and we did a lot of outreach with students just to kind of answer their questions. We also heard from Black chemists that aren't in these traditional roles of, oh, I'm a professor at this university, or oh, I work for this pharmaceutical company. Um, we talked to a lot of people about their journeys, um, about what that looked like and how do we really help people to help Black students get through chemistry or even get interested in it. And then this year, we had our first annual week, which went off amazing. Um, we did <laughs> That's a great. lot of talk about intersectionality um, because, you know, being Black, just like being any race, you can that can mean different things to different people. And people have different identities. You can be you can be a woman, you can be a man, you can be a part of the LGBTQ plus community, you can be disabled, all of these identities. We wanted to talk about how not only does race play a role in how people see us in this field, but also our other identities play a role too. So we did a lot of talking about that this year and also just highlighting other things people can do with undergrad chemistry degrees or PhD chemistry degrees. Um, so we talked to people that were like entrepreneurs, people that have written books, people in government. Um, so it was a fantastic week, um, I think, both years, which was great. So, yeah, it's just a, a grassroots organization that's just trying to do good by black people in chemistry. I love the outreach. Um, like, you're right. When I went to school, if somebody's like, hey, name a chemist, I'd be like, um, pro probably Mari Curie comes to mind. I don't know. If, yeah. Right. Like she's like cross between physics, chemist and mad scientist. Um, but then nothing right blank yeah. until you, and when you start learning about I, when I teach, actually, I have a section in our, in our, in our curriculum. Cause I teach high school where we have to go through the, I call them the old dead guys of chemist chemistry. Mm -hmm. Right. And like yeah. the different models of the atom and yeah, they're, old dead white guys right um so that's really important for students today to see people like yourselves and then be able to see themselves in that field that's a yeah no problem it's something that was near and dear to my heart like i know that i knew what it was like to not see myself or not be able to name any black chemists of my own until i got to undergrad and i just so happened to have had a black woman analytical chemist as my advisor hmm. um and then that kind of sparked this whole, okay, well, I know it's not just me that's doing chemistry and increasing my own network. And then the natural progression was Black and Chem, which I'm so proud of. Um, I can't wait to see what the current leadership team, how, where they take it in the future. Nice. And you know, it's great information for everybody too. Like, yeah. um, you know, when, when I was doing my chemistry undergrad, I knew I didn't, I, and you're right. There's different areas of chemistry. Uh, I was definitely not trained in mass spec at all. Like I knew superficially about it. My, my under, my undergrad was in biochem, like a mixture of biology and chemistry. And I didn't cool. get to even touch a mass spectrometer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the university had one and they're I, like, no, you're biochem. You're not even part of chemistry. Get out of here. You're like one of those dual class people, right? Like a, a warrior mage in Dungeons and Dragons. Nobody likes you. Right. Go away. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just knowing the different types of chemistry and where you could get a job after, uh, that, that would have been helpful for even me when I was in university, um, because I was like, what am I going to do with this? And then yeah. I kind of stumbled into teaching and it's been great. Like, don't get me wrong. I love my job and I'm so glad that's how my life turned out. Uh, but you know, that's amazing resource for everybody. Is there, is there a website or a hashtag or someplace people could go? Yeah, where there is. Yeah. So we are on Twitter. So it's at black and Kim. Hmm. Um, and then the website is blackandkim.org. So everything's pretty simple. You can also just search the hashtag Black and Kim, um, and that will connect you with not only the founders, current leadership team, but also people that are Black in chemistry that are doing really cool things um, science-wise and also outreach-wise and diversity, equity, and inclusion-wise and oh. all that other stuff in between. This is amazing. What a great resource. <laughs> um, I'll make sure those are linked in the show notes to this episode um, Devin, so they'll just be like for everybody listening, you're one click away. Uh, I just got to click the hyperlink folks. You know, the drill. <laughs> I say this every week. I know people check out my links cause I've got data on you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we're kind of getting to the end of our chat. Uh, yourself personally, can people find you somewhere on social media? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter at Devin underscore 11. So my Devin is spelled D E V I N. 
And then you just type the word 11 out instead of the number. Um, and I'm also on, uh, I have a professional website and it's devinthechemist.com. Oh, nice. We'll make sure there's links there as well. Cool, cool, cool. Well, it's been my pleasure to chat with you today. I love talking to you about something that I love chemistry and I get to learn more about an area of chemistry that I, you know, I kind of struggled with or didn't really get to know about. So thank you there. And I'm sure that knowing more about mass spectrum, uh, mass spectrum, Mass spectroscopy. Did I say that right? Mass spectroscopy. Spectrometry. Mass spectronomy. Mass mass spectronomy is <laughs> is going to be better for the framework for everybody that's listening because it's such an important tool for anal, you know analytical chem. So that's great. Um, yeah, and thanks for sharing your stories about Baxter too. And, and Baxter thanks chimed in. <laughs> right, Baxter knew I was talking about him. Okay, it's time for story time with me. Adam, if you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past oh, one or two weeks. You know what? I will start. I don't know if you know, but the dogs are kind of cooped up upstairs. They're not allowed downstairs. We got a little baby gate in the way. They're not allowed to the downstairs area because we're scared that they'll like take something and run back upstairs and then eat it or accidentally throw up because dogs get sick and they throw up where you can't find it and then you find it and then it's the worst <laughs> So we're scared they might throw up downstairs and we won't find it for three months. Um, but when my room is clean, sometimes I let them come downstairs and then come into my room and then we have some fun or I just play with Beaker downstairs and she really likes it. But the funny thing is, is when we have company over, they go mental upstairs the second they hear any sound that is made downstairs. So let's say I have like one of my friends over and we go downstairs to play some video games or something like that. And one of us like nudges the wall just a tiny little bit. The dogs will freak out upstairs, just start barking and barking. And then they get let let downstairs or like someone opens the gate to come downstairs and you can just hear them. And then they're there. (laughs) They're in my room. They bombard the person who is over and then Beaker goes on my bed and then rubs her face into it and goes, (laughs) and it's really weird, but it's actually kind of cute because Beaker, everything that Beaker does is pretty cute. Um, But yeah, that's my story. The dog's going mental downstairs and just having a good time. (laughs) Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. Guess who passed level two agility on Sunday? What? Well, no, it wasn't you, Bunsen. You decided to not jump over the um, pole that we had <laughs> that we set up here at home. Uh, no, it was Beaker. Beaker passed level two. And man, she is fast. She can jump those poles and um, go through the tunnel lickety split. And she's so happy to do it. And so we're signing her up again when there is new agility, probably when the field isn't um, all slushy. So we're looking probably at May or June uh, for agility for Beaker. I want to say she gave uh, Seiko a run for his money. She did. Seiko is like there's uh, a, a trained retriever? agility dog, and I think, I think Beaker beat Seiko. I think I think she did too. <laughs> she's so fast, and she's so happy. So like, she's just she's got a she's built for it. Her little spelt little body and her yeah. fast little legs run. She runs as fast <laughs> as her little legs will carry her, and she, the, the, those little legs can dig really fast too. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's a cutie. And that's my story. Um, Yeah, Beaker is super fast. She can catch a bird out of the air while it's flying. She can run under the bird and then do Sokotoa in her brain and then jump and catch the bird in her mouth. And then boom, now she has the bird. That's happened um, one and a half times. She almost caught two birds in running. With, Um, With one triangulation. With no, no. She she almost got the one bird the one time, and then she got the other bird the second time. She learned from her mistakes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Dad, what's your story? So there's lots of snow outside. It's rapidly melting. So we've had some really warm weather like the last three or four days. So it's like slush everywhere. Um, but we had all of this 
brand new snow and Beaker hasn't been enjoying digging in it. And what's really funny is Bunsen wants to go on an adventure. So we get up to the top of this hill and Beaker will get obsessed with digging into, I think, like a, a gopher hole. Like there's gopher holes up there. I think she can hear them or smell them. And in her little brain, she's like, I will just dig down and eat them or something like she starts to hunt. And so it's it's kind of like, let's go, Beaker. And sometimes she gets obsessed. So I have to go like get very close to her and tell her it's time to go. And what's really funny is while it's annoying for me, it is way more annoying for Bunsen. It makes him super annoyed that Beaker isn't coming on the walk and she's holding everything up. So I'll be like, time to go, Beaker. And she's digging. I'm, okay, so go back. And if she's really not listening, I put the leash on her. So she learns that she has to be with me. Um, and then Bunsen sometimes gets fed up with her and he'll run over and he'll like body check her off the hole. And she doesn't know what's happening. She's like, why would you do that? And Bunsen's like, it's time to go for an adventure. Your adventure is boring. There's a whole world out there to explore. And you're looking in this hole where there's nothing. Anyways, I thought that's really funny that he was getting frustrated with her um, kind of like annoying behavior, go, digging a hole instead of going on the walk. So yeah, that's my story like for positive, this week. Yeah, it's kind of like positive uh, peer pressure. <laughs> I guess so. If peer pressure is like body checking and biting your neck. Maybe. Maybe, maybe some peer pressure is like that. Maybe. Okay. Well, that was story time. Can't wait to see all of y'all um, on the next podcast um yeah bye bye that's it for another science podcast episode thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show special thanks to our expert guest devin the chemist who wowed us with her area of knowledge and i got to talk chemistry yay we'd also like to give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on patreon without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do take it away chris chris kelly Samantha Dodd, Kimberly Bond, Nate Stephenson, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Rater, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Katya Lynch, Marianne McNally, Andrea Persons, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Leela Periello, Lynn Armstrong, Lisa Sports, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Lila Ashir, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathert. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh, <laughs>